one man's family, winner of 47 national awards, a Carlton E. Morse creation. One man's family, now in its 27th year, is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. In 60 seconds, we'll hear Chapter 18, Book 134 of the Barber Family Saga. But today, Betty lowers the boom. It's after dinner in Seacliff, San Francisco, as Father Barber crosses the upper terrace to go through the hedge to his son Jack's house next door. But Betty, Jack's wife, greets him with a certain reserve as he comes gaily into the kitchen. Oh, Betty. Hello. Jack isn't here. Yes. Oh, I thought I heard his car. And that was Kenny Boomster driving out. He was here for his lesson. Forgive me if I finish the dishes. Jack's late tonight, and I've got to write out plans for a potluck supper at the PTA on next month's chair. Uh, uh, what time was that you home? He didn't. He had a lot of extra work to do for Cousin Consider, so he was going to have a tray at the office. Uh, uh, whenever he gets in, I'd like to talk to him. I'll deliver the message. Uh, everything all right with you? Just dandy. Uh, Daniel had a long letter from Hazel today. Mary's in fine fettle now. It cheers her up to have Hazel stay over. Mary is mentally adjusted to the idea of having twin boys. He told me twice before. Oh, did I? Yes, yes. I wrote Hazel to ask Kifford's doctor to send on an extra set of x-rays. Hank will know at a glance whether it might even be triplets. After all, you and Jack had triplets. It's not impossible. Mm. As I told Fanny this evening, a man should never despair. In this fascinating world, things can improve overnight. Here I was, day before yesterday, all but bereft of hope. A man with only one grandson to carry on the family name. No end of granddaughters, of course. But only Andrew Barber to take the Barber name into another generation. Then suddenly, Daniel comes home from Scotland with the latest news, and here we are with the possibility of two... Maybe even three grandsons. Yes, yes. Only three months to wait. In June, we'll know. If they turn out to be nasty little old girls, what are you going to do about that? Hmm? Honestly, Father Barber, it isn't fair. I don't see how you can be so insensitive. You've got beautiful granddaughters, six of them, right here in this house. And you've made them all miserable. Oh? No, you really have. The triplets came in tonight with tears in their eyes. After five minutes with you, they were sunk. Girls are important, too, you know. You'd think men had babies the way you carry on. Your attitude toward women is practically medieval. It really is. Yeah. I'll tell you something right now. I've never told a soul, but you might as well know it. When I had my children, I just dreaded to have you come to the hospital. It hurt me every time. Yeah. You'd come in and make me feel that I'd given birth to a second-class citizen because time after time I didn't have a boy. Oh, no. Yes, you did, Father Barber. And when I had the triplets, that's one day I will never forget. I heard the doctor say, triplets? And then from far away, I heard you say, three little boys, doctor. And he said, oh, no, three lovely little girls. And then a terrible, terrible fighting silence. Yes. Each one of my six girls disappointed you when they were born, and we know it. They're all upstairs right now trying to study, brokenhearted. They heard you singing over there in your garden this afternoon. On top of the world, because now there's another chance you might have grandson. Now, Betty, you know as well as I do how much I love my granddaughter. Oh, for sure. Second best to boys. Yes. A man who already has a great many granddaughters naturally wishes for grandsons. Especially when there's only one to carry on the family name. Oh, I'm tired of that. What difference does it make? Who cares? I do. It's my name. I do not wish to see the line come to an end. I'm sorry, Father Barber. I didn't mean to... Hi, oh, oh. Uncle Jack home yet? Hi, Grandfather. Hold the door, Pinky. I'm going out. Yes, I'll be at home, Betty. Kindly ask Jack to call me. Yes, sir. Brother, want to see Grandfather leave a room? Invite me in. That'll do it. This has nothing to do with you. I spoke up for a change. Did you? Really, Aunt Betty? Well, 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 well. I wish I had the nerve. You know what? If Uncle Cliff's wife should have twin boys, they'll be barbers. And I'm the only... I'm a Murray. <laughs> You'll hate me worse than ever. I bet I'm cut off without a penny. Oh, no, Pinky, you hate. That's an awful word. It's a fact. It started the first time he ever saw me. He looked in the plate glass window at the hospital the night Hank and I were born and took an instant dislike to me because I have pink hair. Oh. That's a fact. 
A pink-headed little guy named Murray? What good was that to him? What he... Listen. There's Uncle Jack. Would you mind running along now? Huh? There's something I've got to tell Jack right away. Oh, oh okay. I'll call you after a while. Yeah, okay, sure. Hi, Uncle Jack. See you later. Well, hurry, Pink. Uh, let him go, Jack. Betty, what's the matter? Hey, you're trembling. I guess it's a delayed reaction. Oh, Jack, I've done something perfectly awful. Trouble? The PTA? Oh, no. I, I insulted Father Barber for about five solid minutes. Huh? I did, Jack. I just stood here and let him have it. Oh, golly. Will you ever forgive me? Sure. I will. Will he? I don't know. I wish you'd go over and find out. Gosh, I said all the things I've dreamed of saying since the girls were born. I'll bet I went too far. Going to the head, Jack sees the silhouette of the white metal table on the upper terrace. Father Barber, tilted back in his chair, is gazing at the star-filled sky. Dan? Yeah, yeah. Betty says you want to see me. Uh, come and sit down, if you will. Lovely night, huh? Everything okay with you? Oh, I never had a happier day in my life, Jack. But perhaps it was a mistake to let it show. Why? Oh, somehow, I failed to make the girls understand how much I love them. Oh, I don't think that's true. Yes, it is. Betty made that very clear. I don't know what she said. I know she's kind of sorry. She was expressing a point of view. Well, not necessarily the right one. If I have not conveyed to my granddaughters a sense of my abiding affection, then I have utterly failed. Naturally, I'm, I'm very happy at the prospect of Clifford having twin boys. Dad, you don't know they'll be boys. Must. Won't entertain any other thoughts. You aren't even sure they'll have twins. I don't say I'm psychic, but they have to be twin boys. Yes, yes, we need them. But the point is, I want my granddaughters to be so sure of my love that I, I dare relax and, and celebrate when the boys are born in June. Well, that's asking a lot, Dan. Every grandchild wants to be loved best. That's poor old human nature. Every grandchild wants to be loved best. Right, George, that's profound. <laughs> that accounts for it. <laughs> you don't need to tell Betty I said so, but her stout defense of her household was very spirited and appealing. Very cute. Yeah, she could be spitfire. Yes, who was that? Uh, who came out? I'm emptying a wastebasket for grandmother. Hey, Uncle Jack, you here? Oh, excuse me. That's all right. I'm leaving. Well, don't let me... Uh, no, I'm turning in. Good night, Jack. Good night, Dan. What's on your mind, son? Brother, you'd think I had bubonic plague. Oh, now. He can't stand me. That hurts, you know it? Since I married Greta, he won't stay in the same block with me. I enter, he leaves. Everybody seems to be starved for love around here. Now, what's your problem? I had a long day, Pinky, and I want to get to bed. Oh, well, okay. I won't bother you now. It's just that things aren't going too hot for me down at the municipal railway, and I need your advice. But if you're tired, we'll let it go. Yeah. Well, if that's coming up, I want to be in first-class condition. Yes, sir. You're going to bed, and thanks for being so kind, Uncle Jack. I appreciate it. It's a novelty. Not many people are. freshly ironed white pajamas. Betty, on her own side of the big double bed, turns off the reading light and waits in the darkness to be spoken to. A silent minute ticks away. You mad at me? Oh, why? You mean the dreadful things I said to your father? Oh, Dad didn't mind. Didn't mind? He thought it was kind of cute. What? Yeah. He thought you showed spirit. Mother defending your young. He approves of that. That's pretty darn patronizing. Now, Betty, forgive him. He's a sad old man. If anything goes wrong, if Mary should have a girl, golly, you'll never get over it. Stay on your own side. But don't talk to me, Jack Barber. Man. No, stay there. This is one night I want to be cool all night long. One Man's Family, which comes to you Monday through Friday, is written by Harlan Ware and directed by Carlton E. Morse. In Chapter 19, Book 134... 
The silent partner makes a move. Frank Barton speaking.